Hello, and thanks for joining us for another Stay at Home edition of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And as always, we're answering your questions about being in the garden. Uh, we've got two of our panelists here today with us on the call, uh, two of our veteran panelists. We've got Kelly and Jen. Uh, so first, uh, Jen, we'll start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your specialty and what you like to do out in the garden. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. Uh, I kind of answer questions about just about anything, but vegetables and houseplants are my favorite thing. Uh, you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. And right now in my garden, I'm trying to figure out how to put my yard back together. We've been in the middle of construction for several months and we're getting closer and closer to having our yard back, but we're not quite there yet. Today, it looks like moles have torn up our yard because some of our irrigation is broken. And so my yard has been trenched. So now it's oh. torn up even more. <laughs> so. In the highlight of our season, like this is our time to be great. And you've got construction going on. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been going on till, since October. So I'm kind of used to it. Oh, but, okay. okay. Yeah, but yeah, try it. Everybody's out in their yard, which is great with the pandemic and everything, but uh, it means that there's a long line of people ahead of us to get the grading and some soil brought in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, hang in there. Hey, we're trying. All right. <laughs> Kelly, go ahead. I'm Kelly Alsop, and I am an extension hor horticulture educator, and I'm based out of Bloomington, uh, Illinois. And uh, my specialty is really, really technically for the state, my specialty is integrated pest management and greenhouse production. But uh, I like to just, you know, since you get to choose your own specialty, I'm going to go with, um, I love insects and beneficial insects and pollinators. And um, I'm really into urban trees lately. And like Jennifer, I love to grow vegetables. So. I like it all too. <laughs> all right. Well, good. We've got, we've got a nice cross section tonight. So um, we've got some show and tells. Uh, Jen, I'll, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, pick which one you want to share first and oh. tell us what you got. I went to a greenhouse last week and bought a few plants. Um, this is called a rickrack cactus. Um, some, some people call it a fishbone cactus or a fishbone orchid cactus. It's really similar to um, how you grow a Christmas cactus. It's a rainforest cactus, so it's used to a little more humidity. Uh, like a cactus, it's going to grow in a really porous, uh, well-drained soil, but it's going to have maybe a little bit more organic matter in it. Uh, they call it fishbone orchid cactus because eventually it will bloom with a really orchid-like flower on it. Uh, so it's one that would stay dry over the winter and you would water it in the summer and we're going to see what I've never had one before. I've never seen it before. I actually got this one at a little shop in Champaign that has really cool plants. So supporting local business. So are you going to keep that inside or is that guy going to go outside for the summer? He's going to go outside for the summer, but uh, I missed out. The guy had um, some hanging baskets. Once they get fuller, they can look really cool um, draping over. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll see. It's supposed to be fairly easy to grow. So we'll see if I can kill this one or not. <laughs> That's awesome. I wonder what it looks like out in the wild too. Like once yeah. it gets really, really big, I'll have to Google that. So speaking of killing plants. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and bear my soul to you right now. Okay. Everything it, it always doesn't work out. And I'm pretty good at making things grow, but every once in a while you run into some things that challenge you. First, it was African violets, and now it is the Norfolk Island pine. So I, and it's my favorite plant, which makes this all the more cruel. This is my second one. Look at this poor guy. This is my second one, and I've killed them both. And I mean, they started out as lovely, full, beautiful trees. And they just kept dropping, dropping, dropping. And this is the last guy that's left. So We've already determined that it's really dead, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> really most sincerely dead. <laughs> yes. So right before the show, um, I had them take a look at it off camera. And Jen says, let me see the roots because that's how you can tell. And so um, as soon as I <laughs> picked the baby up, they were like, oh, yeah, it's absolutely dead. So, you know, you can't win them all, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> 
But what you're showing there is pretty typical of what happens when Norfolk Island pine starts dying. All you end up with is a couple little tufts of green at the top. And they're so crunchy and it's like you breathe in their direction and they snap and fall right off. So sometimes I'll get it. Yeah. If you catch it before it's actually dead, you can sometimes lop off the single uh, stem and you can get multiple stems to grow up from the base. Noted for next time. Yeah. And the little small root system, I know that you overwatered the mm. plant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. You killed off some of the roots. And so I think that is like the biggest issue when it comes to growing houseplants. It's usually not underwatering, but overwatering. And then you throw in a quarantine and it's like <laughs> better water today. <laughs> Uh, or yeah. people people will water every Friday or they'll yes. water, you know, they'll water, you know, this exact mount on yes. day. And that is not how horticulturists do it. We want, you know, everybody asks me, how often do I water this? And Jennifer can tell you when it's dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to vary Friday depending on Saturday. the type of day. Yeah. Yeah. Rookie and, mistake. And, and so... <laughs> No, believe me, we've killed more plants than you ever will. <laughs> yeah, there there seems to be no middle ground with Norfolk Island pine, though. Mm -hmm. My the two questions are either your question, someone that perpetually kills it, or the person that that calls me or emails me, and it's like taking over their living room. Like it's so I, huge. I want to be that person. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, I mean, in the wild, it gets to be ten feet. Uh, in circumference, if you can imagine. Oh my that. gosh. Yeah. That's another one I'll have to look up when we finish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we do have some questions that were sent in and Kelly, uh, we're going to start with you. Um, we have a audio question, which is kind of cool. Okay. We don't get this very often. So um, here is the question that was sent in. Hi, I'm Betty from Matamora, Illinois. I'm calling about a uh, oak tree I have in my front yard it has been dying for the last several years. It started with dropping uh, acorns early. A couple of years ago, we had pebble-sized acorns, but it has been shedding the tips of its limbs for a couple of years now, and I have not been able to find out what it was until last fall when someone gave me a picture of a tiny, itsy-bitsy worm in the node of the limb that would eat away at it and cause it to drop off. Is there anything I can do to uh, kill this worm and save my tree? Thank you. Um, yes. Well, I definitely am happy to be able to answer a question from somebody from the community that I served in Metamora. So I serve Woodford County also. So I'm your hort educator. <laughs> if you ever wanted to know that information, um, but uh, Oak, so my very first instinct was to think about um, twig pruner beetles or twig girdler beetles. And what these beetles do is they lay their eggs on the tips of branches and then they gnaw around where they laid the egg. And one of the reasons that, one of the reasons they do that is because, they actually uh, want to, their larvae, which are those little tiny itty bitty worms that you were referring to, uh, don't want to be growing in a healthy tree. They actually want less sap flow. So by girdling that stem, you get less sap flow. But also by girdling that stem, when wind comes or rain, that's when you get all the branches down on the ground. Um, the females are, um, it, for the twig pruner beetles, they're laying their eggs in the spring. For the twig girdler beetles, they're laying their eggs in the uh, fall. The larvae end up tunneling into branches. They weaken the sap flow. They're definitely harmful to the tree. Um, and then some of them, the, the, after they've gone into the tree, they'll come back to where they were. the egg was laid, and they'll pupate. And so... Um, one of the ways that you can tell between the two, which it doesn't really matter because the uh, uh, recommendation I'm gonna give you is the same for both. If it's a twig pruner beetle, then it's going to have a 
um, a, uh, it's going to be ragged on the outside where the bark is, and it's going to be smooth where the wood is. If it's a twig girdler, it's going to be ragged on the inside and smooth cut on the outside. And so really the only um, real, um, other than calling an arborist and maybe get doing some sort of systemic pesticide to kill the larva inside the tree, sanitation is your key. And that is picking up those twigs and getting rid of them and removing them from the area because those twig pruner beetles or twig girdler beetles are pupating in those twigs. And that's your future um, potential pest issues. So I hope I diagnosed the worm correctly. If I didn't, you can always email me or send in an image or anything like that. But um, I think, I really think it's one of these. What do you think, Jennifer? I have never heard of either. So I would have to do some research. So I hope, I'm glad you've heard of them before. Um, yeah, they're in the, um, uh, the, the first I heard of them was I read the Oak Problems, the University of Illinois Plant Clinic fact sheet. Yeah, that is a good one. Which is a really good fact sheet if you have an oak. And so I read about them in that fact sheet. I never thought about them again. And then I, I had some clients bring in, you know, um, these, they, they were dropping limbs and little twigs all around their uh, oak trees. And so um I, and then I saw it in home yard and garden pest newsletter and I saw it at Morton Arboretum. And so they're a little bit more common than maybe I thought, but probably not as common um, since Jennifer hasn't heard of them, but um, that doesn't mean much, but I, I know. Well, Hey, you can't know everything. It's a, no. it makes your, but it's a beetle and the larva eat the tree. Well, the other thing I thought of is sometimes squirrels will do that, but since she saw the actual larva, that takes you down a different road. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Kelly. All right, uh, Jen, we're going to go to question 918. Uh, okay. Let's see. Rashmi says, onion was sprouting in the pantry. I have planted the cut part in the soil. Beautiful purple flowers have come. Is the stalk edible and will it have onions later? Well, the, the stalk is certainly edible. You'd use it like you would use green onions. Uh, the thing about when you have an onion that has sprouted in your pantry, so it has grown a season already. So when it starts sprouting again, if you leave it too long, you'll notice when you go to grab it, you're like, oh, there's nothing. It's all hollow because it's using up all of the stored energy. If you think of the onion as actually a bulb. So what if you wanted to plant it out in the garden, the um, I'm not sure exactly what this person did if they just took the like the roots and planted it out or what they did, but the recommendation is to take that uh, sprouted onion and open it up and you should find at least two separate sprouts because at this point when it's growing again after it's grown for one year, the number of sprouts inside is increasing. So there should be at least two that you can tease apart. And then you would, it would be um, when we buy sweet onions in this part of the state in central Illinois, you typically buy sweet onions as a plant. And so it would be like that. And you would plant that out. Um, onion sets are similar where they, uh, they separate them out and they kind of um, cure them and then they sell them and they are little tiny onions in the store. Similar thing, but um, this would be a fresh onion set that you would be planting in your garden. But definitely the stock. Yeah, definitely the stock would be edible. Yeah, I would. We've had that happen before. I had a little, um, a popcorn kernel hmm. <laughs> and it tiny little seedling was growing in the pantry in the dark. A little pop or a little uh, corn plant was growing in there. So. Aww. You yeah, gotta, nice. you gotta save it. It was so, it was so persistent. It was, it was, not, it was in the right? middle of winter too. It was like, oh, oh this guy. All right. 923 for Kelly. Uh, this is Heidi from Mahom. It says my maple trees have black on the leaves and the leaves are falling off in clumps. How do I need to treat it? Thank you so much. <clears throat> what are your thoughts? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, um, um, we've had an extremely cool wet spring and it actually has been kind of trending that we've had a cool wet spring 
all the time. We always have a cool, wet spring. And so what that means is lots of tree diseases, especially anthracnose, which is very common disease on maples. Um, they're really, it's really common on, <coughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Do you want to, uh, do you Can need I to get a drink? Yeah, yeah, go for it. A yeah, sure. Um, Jen, do you want to add anything while she's? Uh, there's lots of different forms of anthracnose. It's something that pretty, a lot of different trees get. Maple's pretty notorious for it. And I believe it's actually kind of a, a group of fungus. There's a whole list that falls under anthracnose. I, Kelly, I was just saying that it, there's a group of fungi over in the group of anthracnose, it's all kind of lumped into the same diagnosis. Right. It's, they're different species within the group, but yes. Um, so, um, so uh, anthracnose on maples, it's black spots. It's all over my town, probably all over your town. Um, where you can really find anthracnose is in sycamores. And that usually is every year. In fact, when I was a student in college, that was one of my identification characteristics of sycamores was they had these weird kind of witch's brooms at the end of their tips caused by the anthracnose. I know it's like, it's like this, like this. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I always thought that that's just how sycamores grew. So anthracnose is a fungal disease that's caused by the cool, wet spring. It's considered just an aesthetic problem because by midsummer, it's pretty much going to grow out of it. Now, what's going to happen is they're going to lose, maybe perhaps lose some of those leaves. So you can, you know, maybe, uh, you know, work on your sanitation. You know, when you ever, every time you have a tree disease, Sanitation is always going to be something we say. So, you know, pick up those leaves, pick up the, uh, the ways that fungal pathogens overwinter in your landscape. And uh, then, you know, just uh, work on the health of the tree. You know, it's like we have a really cool wet spring followed by drought. And we know that trees do not respond well to drought and they're more susceptible to diseases and insects when they go through drought. So if you water your trees during times of drought, it'll go through less stress and it'll be able to fend off more of the disease. So uh, that leads to another thing that Jennifer and I and Tanisha were talking about before the show was another thing is happening right now all throughout Illinois. And it is the ginkgo trees are not, they're not pretty, <laughs> saying it nice. And what happened is we, our last frost that we had, um, that occurred when those ginkgo trees were actually, the buds were opening up and the leaves were unfurling. So everybody's ginkgo trees looks really bad um, from leaf distortion to leaf drop. Um, maybe Jennifer, I know Jennifer has a ginkgo tree. What does yours look like right now? Uh, mine looks kind of like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Um, like my Norfolk Island? It's kind of. I mean, <laughs> a little bit better than that. <laughs> yeah, it's some of the leaves escaped damage. And so those are full size and look normal. Uh, the rest of the tree looks, there's like kind of brown crispy bits. And as I've been watching it and now I'm starting to see you've got ne actually next year's leaves because every tree has got two sets of leaves. So it can recover. It's just taking time. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to look more normal. We were worried for a while. My husband actually thought that maybe he's like, I don't, I wasn't spraying anything. Don't blame me. So oh, it was, he was so, ready for the defense. He was ready. Right? I was like, no, it's just, it was frost right at the wrong time. It, it kind of looks like herbicide damage a little yeah. bit. But so will these leaves recover this year or you won't have them until next year? Well, the tree probably could use some extra TLC this year. I was thinking we might do some uh, fertilizer stakes or something, but we fertilize our yard. So it may be just kind of not necessary anyway, but so you're using up the reserves, those, those mm -hmm. new leaves that are the reserves. So it should, it'll be okay. And it'll spend a lot of energy trying to build itself back up again. So if I can 
if I can add some extra watering mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I may throw some, I may put some fertilizer on it just because I love the tree. And it was finally getting to where it was really putting on some good growth and getting to be a good size. That's yeah. always the suggestion I make to people when you know your tree went through a really stressful event, water during times of drought, maybe even a fertilizer, because we mm -hmm. don't normally add fertilizer to tree mm -hmm. here in Illinois. No. Okay. We're going to go to another question. Uh, number 928 for Jen. This is from Anne. The above picture is a Cardinal. Oh man. Wazinski. Did I say that right? I think so. Okay. We're going to go with it. Clematis that I planted one year ago. It sits on the east side of the house and gets the afternoon sun. It didn't seem like there was any hope for it. Thought it was dead, but she wasn't going to give up. Did her best to protect the roots during the winter. And this is what it looks like now. Drum roll, please. Dun, dun, dun. So I had to do a little research on this one because I wasn't familiar with this type of clematis. It's a, it's not a spring bloomer. It blooms in like June, July. So it's a later blooming clematis. So this may be totally normal, what it's looking like right now. But what I noticed in the first picture is that some of the roots are exposed. And so you can see at the base that are kind of radiating out like spokes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, those need to be uh, filled in with some soil and mulched and generally speaking clematis like to have their roots be shaded and cool and their top in the sun and so i would think about maybe planting something that would provide some shade to those roots because she said it's getting afternoon sun and that would tend to get pretty kind of bakey as the summer goes <laughs> on a little bakey yeah. Yeah, little, yeah slow roast we don't want clematis on the slow roast all summer <laughs> Um, but I have, are you familiar with this one, Kelly? I'm not familiar. It's a red flower. It's very pretty. I've never, but it is a later flowering one. I'm not familiar with this particular clematis, but I too looked at this question and, um, I, you know, thought about what it is that makes a clematis grow well. And, um, um, you know, I know that sunlight is super important for clematis at least six hours. Yeah. So, it sounds like she's got that. I too did not like the way the base of the plant looked and thought that she needed to add, maybe add some organic matter on top um, or, yeah. or some additional mulch because I know that clematis don't like that too. And then I thought maybe, um, I mean, consistent moisture um, yeah. might be something. Um but as far as how it looks, I think that may be just yeah. how it looks because I, I have a later blooming clematis in my garden and it just behaves completely different from the other clematis. It dies almost all the way back to the ground where my other clematis usually have some more life along the stems. Okay. All right. We've got time for one more. Uh, maple tree leaves. This is question number 930 uh, from Karen. Can you tell us what's going on with our yellow soft maple tree leaves? Uh, see the attached picture, seems to be affecting the lower third of the tree. It's located on the southeast corner of our lot in front of our home. So let's see what she's got going on uh, with these trees. This looks like another anthracnose problem to me. Do you agree, Kelly? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, probably typical pictures. Well, and you get with anthracnose, you get that kind of tattered look. You think that it's uh -huh. been just whipped through the wind. That's really kind of a telltale sign. The other thing I was uh, was thinking too. Sometimes you get something that is these dark uh, black spots called tar spot in maple, but this doesn't have the say. The tar spot is a real round spot, hence the name. But that tattered look is anthracnose all over it. So. Okay. And Don't can worry. you just again give them um give her just a little a few tips to get the tree back in tip top? Uh, sanitation, pick up those leaves that are dropping. Um cold wet spring is just gonna tend to produce this. Um if you can do anything to open up the canopy at all and increase the air circulation, that may help. But generally speaking, anthracnose is purely a a, a cosmetic appearance problem and by the middle of the summer you don't even notice it okay all right and um kelly I, oh tar, go ahead does tar spot even tar spot i think is more aesthetic because yeah sea trees live year after year after year with tar spot i think yeah. the other one we're going to see a lot of this year 
Um, I wanted to ask personally, what what's the rule of thumb on volunteers? I've got, so I rotate my beds each year. Um, and you find these little volunteers and you know what they are. And it's like, oh, I, you know, this was here last year. So do you guys, you know, yoink those out and, and toss them? Or do you ever get curious and keep them and, and see what happens? Depends what it is, but I've, I've can't let a good plant die. <laughs> <laughs> and just that was, that's, my, that's how I am though in the garden. My husband, if he sees something out of place, it's out of there. But if I, no see matter what, oh yeah, he gets, he wants it right uh -huh. angles, right? Right angles and symmetrical. <laughs> but if I have like pansies that have receded, I've had, or violas, I've had that happen or whatever. I'd mm -hmm. like to see what it is. And sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. And I don't know, I like the more natural look to things. Mm -hmm. And is it true that um, they don't always come back true? You know, if you, yeah, if it was a hybrid, it probably won't. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else that you guys wanted to add about what's happening in your uh, neck of the woods or anything you want to share? Yeah. Um, my chives are blooming, they, which is awesome. I'm seeing lots of bees mm -hmm. of activity in the garden. I'm glad I planted some annuals early on. So, um, you know, go out and get a few annuals, add them to your garden. You don't have to just look at, you know, a mulch. Okay. A, a, a sea of mulch. Plant some plants. <laughs> Plant Let some those plant. volunteers grow. All right. Thank you guys so much for uh, being here and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. <laughs>